Yes. Please if you want me I'm to join to, you, I'm going okay. To, you know, just relax, and I'll invite you. All right. Thanks. everybody and a very warm welcome. My name is Rowena Arshad and I'm the head of school here at Murray House School of Education and I would like to welcome each and every one of you to this afternoon's public lecture. I'd like to thank first of all the research cluster group on social justice in the School of Education that has actually enabled this lecture to take place. So for those of you who are involved in this, quite a few of you dotted around the room um, thank you very much indeed for enabling this. Um, and also actually to yourself and for actually helping with the arrangements and Barry for the live streaming. At the end of the session, there is Drake's reception next door. So I hope some of you will be, if not all of you, will be able to stand and stay back and enjoy and network and talk and discuss what you've heard. So you'll be very welcome to stay. 
There are no fire alarms uh, expected, so if it happens, it's real. And therefore, <laughs> quietly, slowly, methodically, straight to where you came in, and then we'll meet at the quad, which is where the gathering point is. At the end of the talk, there will be a chance for us to have open discussion and also questions um, for panelists. So, let me now move on to introduce our speaker for this afternoon. Dr. Vargas, as you can see in the slide, is currently a project officer with UNESCO and part of working towards the Agenda 2030 for sustainable development. But before joining UNESCO, he has been involved in many different areas from third sector, civil society, um, academia to local government. He has been a researcher as well as a practitioner and I rather suspect also an activist in this um, area. Covering a range of issues from it involving education, whether it's adult education, lifelong education, but always within a lens that takes into account issues of human rights, well-being, and also thinking about the role of public policy and social responsibility in these areas. I know this afternoon you'll be drawing out some of the key themes from the book that you have kindly given most of us that's in, um, in front of you, Rethinking Education Towards a Global Common Good. I think this talk is very timely. Now more than ever, education needs to step up and become even more active in its role as a transformative agent. In an increasingly, I fear, unstable situations across the world, some say it is the lack of education and critical citizenry that is allowing the political turbulences that we are seeing on a daily basis. So I think we must rethink the focus of education and make equality, social justice and human rights front and centre. So I very much look forward to your talk. Carlos. Thank you, Roberta. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Ashman, for this uh, introduction. Um, it is an honor for me to be at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, I would like to thank the Maury House School of Education, particularly uh, its chair, uh, and also uh, the team of Professor Sheila Riddell, a good colleague uh, of mine, and a wonderful team who made this possible, organizing this. Uh, so, yes, as, as it's been presented, the idea of um, of today's session is to present some of the main tenets of a publication that came out in 1995 that you have in front, I'm sorry, in 2015, which you have in front of you, which is uh, Rethinking Education Towards a Global Common Good. Uh, and the idea that we discussed briefly with Sheila was to say what is the role or what are the challenges in terms of equity and inclusion that are present in the publication, but also that are uh, right now very relevant in terms of the global education landscape, in terms of the changes that we are witnessing today in uh, the governance of education particularly, but also in defining, determining, and struggling for the purpose of education, what kind of education we would like to see. So, um, as I was saying, uh, well, Rethinking Education, this, this publication is the, the product of an expert group that was put together at, uh, by the Director General of UNESCO in 2013. And basically, the idea was to revisit the purpose of education in today's day and age, to see what are the changes that there have been in the world, and how education is responding to these changes and challenges or not. So basically, it was to revisit the purpose of education, and the organization of learning in today's um, context of increased complexity, uncertainty, and contradiction. So basically, that was the call for this, for this publication. And it came out at a particular um, interesting juncture, which was uh, when the Education for All agenda and the Millennium Development Goals of the United Nations were coming to an end. They were coming to an end in 2015. And we saw actually that many of the goals that the international community had set to achieve had not been achieved. So there was, it was an impasse, it was a good moment for reflection to see 
why these intentions and why these long-term global agendas, some of them 15 years, some of them 25 years old, didn't come to fruition. So that was the moment in which the new sustainable development goals agenda for uh, transforming our lives for 2015 was coming into play. So it came at a very, uh, a very specific time. And as I said, the objective of, of this group and of the objective of the publication was to rethink the purpose of education and the organization of learning, and to also say, or, or to also stimulate public policy debates around these issues. So it's important to say that this publication is not a roadmap, it's not a blueprint uh, for educational reform, but rather for the kind of discussions that need to be had at the level where educational reform happens. So a little bit of it has to do with some global trends, but also to see how these global trends translate into specific local realities. So this tension between the global and the local, which I will be touching upon later on, is something that is very present in the publication. So um, as you probably know, uh, this is not the first report that UNESCO puts together on the future of education with some kind of foresight function. There have been a few others. Uh, and in, in, in revisiting the relevance and the currency of these uh, publications, what was done in order to produce this last one was to review what were the main tenants and what had happened after two seminal reports from UNESCO had been published, which had had a similar intention, particularly in 1972, uh, the Fogg report, uh, which, uh, or learning to be, that's the way it was also uh, known back in the day. Uh, it basically posed uh, two uh, suggestions. One of them was the formation of learning societies, and on the other one, the principle of lifelong education, which at the time, if you're familiar with the report, it was proposed as an organizing principle for educational reform. Unlike this publication, the, 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 the Fogg report was indeed planned to be a driver for reform, particularly the principle of lifelong education, which then was taken up and, and, and turned into lifelong learning. We'll speak about that as well. Um, 24 years later, in 1996, we saw the Delors report, Learning the Treasure Within, which was also the result of um, uh, an, an expert group that was put together to, to, thought of, to think about the, the future of education uh, in the 21st century. This was back in 1996. So you're probably familiar with the Delors report, whose biggest, greatest contributions were what we call the four pillars of education, so a multidimensional, holistic view of education, which included not only learning to be, which was the first original proposal in, in the Ford report, which was more transcendental, but also to reconcile learning to be with learning to know, with learning to do, so it's a bit more pragmatic in nature, but also to learning to live together. So the idea of citizenship, the idea of uh, relationality was also present in there. So these two reports and their main tenants were revisited in order to put together uh, rethinking education. Now, they both share, and so does rethinking education, they share a particular take, a particular view of education which is humanistic in, in nature. However, they came out at a particular context. Yeah. The, the kind of issues, the kind of um, realities that they were called to address were very different. And therefore, also many of the sources that they elaborated from were very different as well. So in 1972, I mean, a historical context coming out of the social movements of the 60s, influenced, of course, by the social and educational theories of the time. So, of course, we can think of de-schooling and pedagogy of the press. We can think of Ivan Illich and Paulo Freire, which were very much involved, this, this kind of thoughts in the development of learning to be, whereas, the Delors report was more uh, influenced by a new trend and a new way of thinking which was more pragmatic in nature. Uh, not less revolutionary, but responding to different, to different uh, challenges, particularly the growth uh, of, of um, transnational capitalism on the one hand, and the beginning as well 
of globalization. So we do have very important uh, foundations on which to build a reflection on the purpose of education, but the Delors report was published 20 years ago already. So it, is a, a, it was a good time to revisit it and to update and to think, I mean, we agree on the, perp on, on the humanistic approach to education, which is based on human dignity and well-being, but then the, the challenges we face today in realizing that vision are very different from 20 years ago, particularly the increased uh, pace of globalization of the mobilities of people and capital and ideas has really transformed the, the, the realities that we want to respond to. So uh, there were a few emerging trends and tensions that were identified in the report. Uh, one of these was, of course, uh, the, more, the move towards more sustainable lifestyles and sustainable forms of production and consumption. So we see that this, since 1996 and up until today, uh, the patterns of ecological stress uh, of uh, uh, environmental degradation have been very speedy and have been uh, relentless and have had an effect on our ways of life. Then secondly, we, uh, we, we assist to a moment where the growth, economic growth in particular, or the production of wealth is much greater than it has ever been before. However, it comes hand in hand with rising vulnerability and with growing inequalities. There's also a particular uh, trait of today's society, which is global and which is interconnected. So today we also have the possibilities and the tools to connect more easily with one another, so to have a grower interconnectedness. But at the same time, a little bit of a, of a paradox is while we have more tools to be connected and for the exchange of ideas, we see also rising levels of intolerance, of violence, of identity politics. And, of course, this new context of societal transformation requires that we revisit the purpose of education and the organization of learning, taking into account these new traits of social reality which were not there before. So there are basically two things that the publication proposes. One of them is to counter the, non the dominant development discourse. Uh, and here, by, by the dominant development discourse, we're thinking particularly of uh, certain approaches to education that have to do, that are very closely related to human capital development theory, and which see education instrumentally just as a tool, and particularly a tool for economic growth and for economic development, which is the pervasive and the dominant acceptation of, um, of education in, in, in global uh, development discourse these days. So we see that this has, a, this, this, Economization of, of, of education has also had an effect as to how we think about it and to how, as to how we think the purpose of education is, how we organize actually educational action from the curriculum to assessment to greater effects. So the idea was to try to counter this dominant discourse by reaffirming a humanistic and integrated vision of both education and development. And the idea was to recontextualize some of the foundational principles for the governance of education. In particular, the principle of education as a public good. When we say that education is a public good, do we mean that it is in the public domain, that there's a state responsibility? If so, to what extent, what is it that the state is responsible for doing? Is it solely a state ob uh, obligation and responsibility? Or do other stakeholders in society uh, or are other stakeholders also responsible for education? And in doing what are we talking about? Its organization, are we talking about its normativity? Are we talking about its funding, its provision, its regulation? So the global governance of education was also uh, a, a good um, excuse to revisit this idea of the public good. That's why the, 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 book, the book's subtitle is towards a global common good, with a question mark at the end. That's important to, to say. Are we moving towards a global common good 
if it is a global common good, how does it differ from what we understand traditionally as a public good in a non-economic uh, conception? Uh, what does a humanistic vision of education look like? Well, basically, it is one that is grounded on humanistic principles, which were ethical uh, principles like the respect for life and human dignity, equal rights and social justice, the respect for cultural and social diversity, the need for international solidarity, and seeing a shared responsibility for our common future. So the idea of common good very much heads towards that direction of a shared responsibility in education and in social life in general. Uh, with, of course, a central concern for sustainable human and social development and with a greater attention to equity and inclusion. Uh, equity and inclusion in many different ways. Uh, so it has to do with also introducing different cosmovisions, different worldviews, around ideas of well-being, ideas of development, ideas of education. So this idea of recognizing the diversity of worldviews has to do with balancing the universal and the particular at many different levels, at levels of understandings of knowledge, learning, education, but also understanding of the way of ways of life, things like indigenous knowledge, things of epistemologies, from the South, for example, uh, different knowledges that have been colculcated, that have not been legitimized and introduced in education policy or in curriculum. So these kind of, of, of ideas are, of course, part of a humanistic vision of education. And it was important to do so as well, because the notion of, of education as a, as a public good is currently under strain. On the one hand, we have expanded access to education, which of course has meant and translated into some pressure on public financing, the pressure on public education systems to deliver. Uh, on the other hand, we have seen also the greater involvement by non-state sectors and non-state actors. It could be, on the one hand, the private sector, but also the social sector, also the costs that are increasingly being borne by individuals, by families. So it has to do also with the privatization of education as is seen in the slide. We see a change in the scale of the scope and penetration of, 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 of the private sector in all aspects of education on the one hand. But on the other hand, this idea of opening up the notion of the public good also has to do with a need for more voice and more participation of other stakeholders other than the state in determining what we learn, when we learn, and why we want to learn, so on and so forth. So the idea of public participation in education is behind uh, revisiting the, the, the idea of public good, but also the risks related to rampant privatization, which opens up the floodgates for um, for inequality and for exclusion and for the reproduction of, of disadvantage. So the idea is also to revisit this, um, to look at the risks that are related to commodification and to the marketization of education in today's world. So then, um, in order to supplement the idea or the notion of the public good, the notion of common good is introduced in the publication so as to being able to bridge this otherwise dichotomy of the public and the private. Yeah? There is a blurring boundary between what is public and what is private today. When we say public education, do we mean it is funded by the state? Or is it public because it's in the public interest? Or is it, or, or is it public because it is normed, governed, ruled, and normed by the state? Or is it public because it is of public concern? Or because if it's an object of public policy? So that is important to say. And when we say private, does that mean that it's private for profit, private not for profit? Uh, is it private in its organization and provision? Or is it private in the way it is, um, for example, the curriculum is built? So it is not very easy anymore to say or to, to distinguish 
private for public. There's a, blur, there's a blurring boundary there that needs to be addressed. Uh, but beyond uh, this dichotomy, the notion of common good, what it does, is to reaffirm a collective dimension of education as a shared societal endeavor. That means that it's not only for the state to norm and regulate, and it's not only the state responsibility, but everybody in society shares that responsibility, because it integrates an acknowledgement of the diversity of context and conception of human well-being, a little bit of what we said in the previous slide. So it brings in other views, other ideas of development, but at the same time, it brings forward uh, a core set of values which is shared, which, which are presumed to be universal, basically issues around human rights. And because it emphasizes the participatory process of public policy formulation and implementation. Now, in order for education to be considered as a common good, then knowledge needs to be considered as a common good as well. So knowledge needs to be considered as a common heritage of, 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 of humanity, basically. There is no way in which we can advance in education as a public endeavor, as a common good, if we don't think of education, sorry, if we don't think of knowledge along the same lines. The, cre the creation, the transmission, the acquisition, but also, and, and most importantly, uh, the marketization and the commodification of knowledge. We can see it in many different arenas, in many different areas. For example, the way pharmaceuticals, for example, use indigenous knowledge about herbs and traditional medicine, and how uh, it is copyrighted, how it is privatized, but not also that, but also how it is never legitimized, these different forms of knowledge. So it has to do not only with the issue of who holds the patents or the rights to something, but also to how we understand that we are all producers of culture and that we all have uh, uh, a right not only to produce knowledge, but also to access uh, everybody else's knowledge. So these theories around uh, the theory of the commons, for example, is one of these, uh, it would be an example of how knowledge can be seen as something that is shared and that should be shared if we want more egalitarian societies, and particularly if we want education to thrive as a, as a common good. Just gonna have a sip of water. So uh, that is very much the landscape uh, against which rethinking education was, was produced. As we said, um, a landscape that is very complex and whose governance is equally complex. On the one hand, we've spoken about the, the blurring line between the public and the private, but that's not the only blurring light right now in terms of in terms of educational policy making or educational uh, development. There's also a blurring line between the global and the local as, as, as the locus of decision making in education. Increasingly, we can see that education is no longer decided solely at the national level. That is, that is a fact. There are also many other actors that influence decision making in education, particularly at the global level. There's a role of of IGOs and banks and international organizations and private sector and corporations and so on and so forth. So there are many players now who actually influence policy making and decision making in education, which used to be, until very recently, a solely national concern. It, it, it is no more. So it's important to say that policy making in education doesn't happen in the local anymore, or not solely, and that there's a global dimension to it where decisions are made, where different agendas are set and promoted. And also that, to say importantly as well, that is not only in the global that education takes place, but in different multi-layered spaces, in networked connections between the global and the local, that decisions are made. So that's important. That's a, that, that's a new trait um, of, of social reality which wasn't there in the 90s. I'm not going to abound on the, on, the, on the blurring boundary between the public and the private, but a third boundary that was addressed is the boundary, which is also a blurring line between formal 
non-formal and informal learning. So as we think of education and the different ways in which we acquire uh, knowledge and, and learning, it is increasingly less so in formal systems. So education systems, which used to hold a monopoly of education and a monopoly of learning, they have, uh, they have very much uh, been left behind by other forms in terms of information technologies, but not only that, also the realization that we learn from the cradle to the grave, that it is part of the human condition to learn throughout life, but also that certain conditions and, and, and certain supports are needed for this learning to take place. So once again, the whole idea of lifelong education and lifelong learning, not only that it is lifelong because we learn throughout the course of our lives, but also that it is life-wide that we learn about in many different domains and in, in about many different things. And some people would say life deep in terms of, reflex, of, of reflexivity and, and the such. So there's also a very, this, this brings a lot of uh, problems when it comes to the governance of education. If we think about how to norm education, how to make decisions, how to organize learning in a context which is halfway between the global and the local, which might be more public than private or otherwise, or how do we interrelate informal learning, non-formal learning with formal forms of education. That is something that I think education systems have been very slow in responding to. Uh, so rethinking then basically brings in these reflections, uh, but it doesn't come alone at long, uh, as, as, as a development of UNESCO. So we think, well, we have these ideas, but then how do we make them actually come to fruition and, 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 and materialize? Well, one of the ideas that there are, of course, is, as we said, uh, the global agenda for uh, education, education 2030, which is, as you know, one of the sustainable development goals. As I was saying, this, this book came about at a very interesting time because decisions were being made as to the agenda for 2030, which is the, the sustainable development goals, which you might be familiar with, uh, which is a set of 17 goals that are proposed to be reached by the year 2030, which involves all sorts of topics from poverty and hunger, to gender equality, to sustainability, to citizenship, uh, to partnerships for development, peace, justice, and institutions. Well, there are quite a number of them. I, I invite you to visit uh, the website of the Sustainable Development Goals to get to know them more. There, each of these goals have a set of targets, and these have been, as you probably know, been uh, discussed and ratified in 2015. So basically, this is the blue map that we're thinking is not as to where we want to move with education until, well, in the next 15, in the next 15 years. Uh, goal number four has to do with uh, quality education. Of course, it's not the only goal in which education is mentioned and involved because there's a lot of education in terms of reaching gender equality, for example, or in sustainability, or in fighting poverty and hunger. But there is one particular goal which is dedicated to education, which is Sustainable Development Goal 4. Now, the, the, the objective of the Education 2030 of Sustainable Development Goal 4 is, as it reads, to ensure inclusive and equitable quality education and to promote lifelong learning opportunities for all. This is basically the ambition of the goal, uh, and it has 10 targets uh, in order to achieve this. Now, it's important to say that uh, this agenda is much more aspirational than the previous agendas. You know, it's usually the case that in the global north, when we speak about education for all, sounds like a slogan and not like a global action plan that took place for 15 years because there was a big focus on the South, 
on the global south, those countries where the educational level was the lowest, where the literacy rates were the lowest, and so on and so forth. So the goals, for example, in the Millennium Development Goals uh, were very much focused in the global south. The difference with this agenda is that it is more aspirational. It basically applies to all nations, uh, regardless of the level of development. Uh, there are in the targets um, and, and, and in the goal itself many different things that need to be achieved by both developed and least developed nations. So just to run you through the targets very quickly, I'll, I'll also invite you to, to, to check this later online. But the targets basically uh, suggest uh, reaching uh, universal primary and secondary education in the world by the year 2015, which means um, at least uh, 12 years of uh, publicly funded, that's important to say, publicly funded education, uh, well, nine years, preferably 12, nine years are the ones that are compulsory, uh, including one year of early childhood care and education, which is also to be mandatory for, for all countries, uh, equal access to technical, vocational, and higher education. So here, the, the ensuring equal access to higher education is something that uh, remains a challenge in many, many different countries. Uh, developing skills for employment, decent work and entrepreneurship at different levels. This, of course, all of these goals, not all of these targets break into many others that I will not stop in, but it's just for you to get a, a sense of, 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 of what kind of targets are in the goal. One which is very important, I mean, all of them are, but for this lecture is 4.5. It's a target which focuses on equity and inclusion in education, and it actually particularly focuses on different population groups that have been historically disadvantaged and discriminated against. That's the case of women and girls, people living with disabilities, special needs, indigenous peoples, the working poor, the under well, the disenfranchised, so on and so forth. So there is a very important focus on equity uh, that, 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 that needs to be addressed. Uh, then there's a, a target on literacy and numeracy for youth, achieving, of course, universal literacy and numeracy at the basic level for all youth and uh, a proportion of adults. Education for sustainable development and lifestyles, which, in, which comprises human rights, education for peace, education for gender equality, global citizenship education, etc. There are another three targets which we could see more as means of implementation. For A, which is about enabling safe and enabling learning environments. So it has to do with how uh, the environments, how not, it's not only about the infrastructure, but also how safe environments are needed for learning to happen. And safe means safe from discrimination, safe from violence, safe from hunger. It's a, it's a wider approach to it. Uh, there's a, a second means of implementation, which is the scholarships, particularly for post-compulsory level education, vocational education and training, higher education, a particular lookout for STEMs and ICTs. And even though these scholarships are for all countries, there's a particular emphasis, of course, in developing countries having uh, or been able to access these scholarships. And of course, the issue of teachers, the issue of having qualified enough amounts with decent working conditions and continuous training core of teachers uh, for education to happen. Now, these are the targets. If you, if you open up the Framework for Action for Education 2030, you'll see these are the targets. And you'll possibly see that this is what governments will be reporting against. They'll say, all right, so I reached these levels of 4.1 or 4.2 or 4.3. But if you read it carefully, those are not the only commitments that you find 
in the declaration and in the, in the framework for action. There are other commitments. As we said, one of them has to do with the public provision, so a publicly funded pre-primary education and full cycle of primary and secondary education. Then there are particular financial commitments in terms of allocating at least four to six percent of GDP to education, or at least 15 to 20 percent of the total public expenditure should be devoted to education, which is an international an international agreement as of 2014. Uh, of course, commitments to inclusion, to equitable education, so the issue of equity is paramount, the issue of quality in education, and that it is for everybody. This is one of the slogans of the Transforming Our Lives uh, campaign the, the, for the Sustainable Development Goals, but for education it applies equally which is the purpose is to leave no one behind. So as you can see, there's a reiterated emphasis on inclusion and on equity in education. Now, what does that mean in terms of translating these principles? I think that is pretty much what we would like to discuss here. Uh, so in order to rethink inclusion and equity, I think the first thing we need to do is to rethink its definitions and to see how we conceptualize inclusion and equity, therefore to try to elucidate what are the supports, what are the reforms, what is needed in terms of educational systems, educational policies, educational programs uh, to be inclusive and to be egalitarian. Uh, I just, just pasted there two definitions from an upcoming publication, some guidelines on equity and inclusion by UNESCO which define inclusion as the process that helps overcome barriers limiting the presence, participation, and achievement of learners. So if we look at that uh, definition, then we necessarily need to look at what these barriers are. What are the obstacles that learners have in accessing education, in remaining in education, and in actually benefiting from education? And these, these barriers and these obstacles can be of different natures. They could be structural, they could be cultural, they could be economic, they could be political. Um, they could be of so many different sorts. So it is important then to unpack the, the problems that are more social, more cultural, more political or economic in nature that actually prevent education from taking place. And, 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 and which actually exclude people from participating in education. And then the definition of equity, which is, of course, having a concern with fairness, so that the education of all learners is seen as having equal importance. So this makes us turn to the issue, of course, of discrimination, and, or of affirmative action, or of social justice, or of human rights. There are different approaches to how these uh, principles can actually be materialized. And one of the lasting questions is, are these to be overarching principles for policies and programs, or do we need a specific policies and programs to address it? I think that is a very lasting question in terms of, of equity and inclusion. Do we make this, do we mainstream equity and inclusion throughout policies, throughout educational programs, from the curriculum to assessment? Or do we create a specific policies that address particular groups? That's kind of like the, the dilemma in this, in this kind of uh, education. Uh, so that's something to be determined. And so, it, so are the approaches to equity and inclusion that we might take. So just to think of two of them, one of them, of course, because it is part of a humanistic approach to education is seeing education as a human right in its totality. What does education as a human right look like? First of all, saying as a, education as a human right, as a key human right, which actually holds the key to opening up other rights, like the right to work, the right to participate politically, the right to uh, vote, I don't know, all of this 
different rights that are actually enabled by the fulfillment of the right to education. And now, the fulfillment of the right to education entails, according to the Office of the Special Rapporteur to the Right to Education, that education needs to comply at least with four attributes, the four A's in education that you might be familiar with. We can only say that the right to education has been fulfilled once education becomes available for all, accessible to all, that it is of acceptable standards to all, and it adapts to the different needs in terms of language, or in terms of infrastructure and accessibility, or in terms of inclusiveness of viewpoints and worldviews, or in many other different terms. So it is important to say that the framework of uh, a human rights-based approach might be a very interesting one to try when uh, trying to make education inclusive and, and, we want to, and, when, and when we want to promote equity in education. So breaking, like, like uh, basically unpacking the idea of availability, access, acceptability, and adaptability on what it means, particularly for the peoples that have been underrepresented historically. Which brings me to the second approach to equity and inclusion, which is that, of course, of social justice, which is the name of the program uh, that's holding this, this, this lecture. And of course, different approaches to social justice as well. On the one hand, we see distrib the distributional approach and the relational approach brought forth by Iris Young. So, saying that achieving justice is not only a matter of distribution or redistribution of resources, but it is also a matter of having more horizontal and less hegemonic relations in society that the sources of social justice can be many, and it has many different dimensions, that, that, that redressing social justice is not only an economic matter, that there's also, as Nancy Fraser pointed out, cultural injustice and political injustice, and that these different forms of injustice and cumulative disadvantage through time that different populations have been exposed to, of course, beg for an approach to education that will take into consideration what are these economic disadvantages? What are these cultural and political disadvantages? So in, in terms of what Nancy Fraser, Fraser suggests, of course, the politics of redistribution, recognition, and representation. Uh, there are other approaches to, to social justice uh, that concern an ethics of otherness or alterity, uh, particularly something developed by two uh, French post-structuralists, uh, Emmanuel Levina and Jacques Derrida, which talk about the otherness, how we identify on how we are interlocuted and how we are defined by others, how our own self is only defined by the way others define us, and then therefore the other, and the other as an authentic other with their differences, uh, differences which are then embraced and not causes for discrimination, uh, then actually enable an ethics of, of equality in, in the social sphere. So there are different ways and different lessons that can be drawn from, um, to, to equity and inclusion. These are just only some of uh, the ones, some of which, particularly the right to education, are addressed in, in rethinking education. So I guess the questions that, we, that are left uh, for us to address, and possibly I'm hoping the debate, and the debate will lead in this, in this direction, is how, how to develop policies that are inclusive and equitable. Do we take this as, as, as mainstreaming principles, or do we make specific policies uh, for specific groups that have been excluded, that have been marginalized from education, and to what results? Uh, also important to say is what forms of exclusion and inequality are fostered by education systems. So sometimes we think that inequality lies in the lack of access to education, but then we also know that education systems exclude and discriminate, and they might produce exclusion and, and, 
and inequality. So what are those forms of exclusion and inequality that are fostered by education systems? Now, how do we embrace differences? How the diversity and the individual difference is a source actually of relationality, of relating to one another, of enriching the educational experience and not a source of difference in terms of discrimination or the difficulties of, of, of planning uh, educational actions. And my final question would be, how can a humanistic approach to education, like the one that, that, that Rethinking Education proposes, how can it be inspiring in this regard? So I'm hoping the, the questions will give us some food for thought, and that will give us also some time to reflect upon it. Thank you very much. us to think and maybe we could go back to the questions sure. and we'll leave them on the um, slide and um, this is your time now uh, questions but obviously you have a contribution to make this is us having a conversation so it's a two-way process so anyone at all uh, to kick us off yes please we'll wait for the mic yeah Correct me if I'm wrong, Carlos, but I think you never mentioned the word religion once. Am I right? You're right. <laughs> <laughs> and I think avoiding that subject, um, you know, we have to address it. Um, and you talk about humanistic being, you know, equitable and all of that. But um, forgive me anyone who's religious, but some, most religions actually generate inequality. So. If you want to be all inclusive, and including cultures and that kind of thing, you have to also include religion. But then you're also bringing in, I don't want to be dramatic, but it's like a virus which you have to tackle. <laughs> Sorry, not, not, nothing against religion, but, but it is a fact that we do not um, seriously um, break down what, you know, what religion actually encompasses. I mean, most of the religion is, is pretty good, but there's about 25% of it which actually reverses itself, which is, contradicts its own humanistic and, you know, that sort of thing. So, in terms of inclusive and equitable, I think that needs to be um, approached, as also the word emotion wasn't included either. And, um, you know, emotion is, uh, is very important when it comes to culture and, mm -hmm. and also, um, emotional intelligence, for example, and that sort of thing. Okay, thank you very much for that. I'm going to leave you to mull over, and I want to actually see if there are other questions, because often with these sort of sessions, the first couple of questions, uh, we get lost and we, we talk in depth with it, and then other people have areas they want to raise, and we get, we don't have, we run out of time. So I'd like us to see if there's anyone else. So a couple of hands up now, can I give, okay. So Carlos, if I take a few more, sure. okay? Uh, Carlos, if you're really warm and wants to give goals for your being set or part of uh, the strategy, um, I wonder if you feel that we should also include goals for the better management of the education system so that the resources that are being uh, voted for education actually end up in education and training and then deliver those positive goals. Okay, so that's the management of education systems to enable us to deliver the warm, fuzzy, positive uh, goals that have been said. Okay, Sheila. Um, hi, Carlos. My question really is about whether we should be optimistic or pessimistic. I mean, one of the paradoxes is that globally, inequality, economic inequality is decreasing, but within countries, economic inequality is increasing. So, I mean, the same applies in relation to education. So I just want to do your thoughts on that. OK, thank you. And I've got one more, and then we'll pause, Carlos, and allow you time to reflect on these. Um, I was just wondering how you feel that these feed into teacher education. Um, obviously, being in my house, 
we have a lot of people training for teachers. And because the focus is on equity and inclusion, and you spoke about how it's becoming more global rather than local, obviously barriers that you brought up um, in relation to inclusion are different in different areas. They are different in different localities. So do you think that um, teacher education needs to focus not so much on content, but more on what barriers there are to children or other people um, lacking access to education? Thank you. What a wide array of questions there. It is. <laughs> um, but I'm sure they'll join up at some point. So I'm going to turn over to you with uh, well, whichever order you want to take it, really. All right. Um, I'll, I'll take them in the order they were, they were asked. Uh, the issue of religion is a tricky one. Uh, I, I agree that it has to do with, and, and the same with emotions, they, they, they have to do and they form part of the culture. Uh, and it is true that the cultural dimension of education is one that usually is not really included into, into curricula and into, and into education systems. Uh, however, one must be careful when it comes to, um, to religion and education uh, because, of, because of history of, of, of the development of education systems before the 18th century uh, and the effect that religion had in, in terms of, I'm thinking mostly in terms of indoctrination rather than, than, than education in, in the spirituality and, and the such, so, yeah, yeah, so, but now, of course, there would be, as part of culture, a need for um, including issues such as uh, spirituality, uh, religious beliefs and religious practices. Now, how do we keep that as part of diversity, as part of inclusion, I think is a challenge. I think it is a challenge today, uh, particularly when we see a lot of uh, Islamophobia in the West, for example, it is very difficult to think about how education in Quranic schools, in madrasas, takes place and has historically taken place. Uh, how do we introduce the, spirit, the, the spiritual dimension of education in a way that it is not part of the mandated curriculum, so to speak? Oh, it is true, it is true, but, but it is also true that we need to dismount some uh, religious precepts that have pretty much, that, that have really imbricated in educational thought. I'm just thinking now the issue of humanism itself. When we, when we think about humanism, and that's one of the criticisms that we've had on the report, which I think is a very valid one, is that uh, we need to revisit our, the, the idea of humanism and not only of Christian humanism of Western humanism, you know? That's, that's I mean, it, it's part of the, of, of the revision process, you know? It's a big one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, is, it is a challenge. <laughs> but thank you for the question. Um, the following question had to do with, uh, was that Sheila's, or was it? it? The systems. Yeah. yeah, about the goals for, for, for the management of education systems. Well, I would say that a trend that we see today, this idea of, of participation in education, uh, brings together a zest for accountability in education. I think that every time more, the issue of the efficiency of the resources, how they are used, especially when public funding is squished. Uh, we're witnessing uh, kind of like a, a rise of accountability systems. How they're put in place is a different story. But the idea of having systems of accountability by which we say and we can see where the resources are being utilized, to what effect they are being used, whether the management of the education system is something that is achieving its purposes or not, I think is something that is increasingly increasingly growing. Sometimes it is growing in a, to a bureaucracy, but, uh, but I think the, the trends that we can see at the global level is for systems of accountability that look into the efficiency of the education systems. 
which needs to be problematized as well, the idea of, of efficiency. But, but do you think UNESCO is uh, dodging the issue by not having it as a top-level goal in the strategy? It is not. I, I wouldn't say it is not in the strategy. For example, if you look at the, at, at the idea of uh, teachers, but uh, it definitely it is within its mandate. Um, there are the, the UNESCO has a series of, of specialized institutes, one of them which is the IIEP, the International Institute for Educational Planning, for example, which has developed a set of guidance notes, toolkits for, for educational planners, and which look at this issue of efficiency and management and the such. So it is true it doesn't have a prominent role in the goals, but it's not something that is not worked on. If, if you look at, um, and there are actually three different sites of the IIEP, the headquarters is in Paris, but there's also an institute in Buenos Aires for the Spanish-speaking world and Latin America, and there is an institute in Dakar, in, in Senegal. Um, and basically what they do is different forms of training, capacity building, but also pro the, the production of their there are notes and guidelines, which I would invite you to visit. Uh, I think they are very much what they're trying to do is to see if we want to reach these aspirational goals, what kind of planning and sector analysis do we need? Uh, as to the pessimistic and optimistic question, that's a hard one. I try to remain optimistic. Um, I would say in terms of um, what we're looking at in the global vis-a-vis -vis the local is something of concern because basically what it does is it reflects inequality at different levels. How at the global level we are moving in a certain direction that might be actually the opposite that the local level is following. Which is, I think, all the more reason to address this kind of fictitious divide between the global and the local. Um, I would say if one steps out of the local level, there might be more reasons to be optimistic, as you said, because you see that there are trends in terms of, for example, participation of different groups in education. There are terms in terms of outcomes. There are, there are different trends that make you be a little bit more optimistic. Uh, I would say at the local level, we, it, it, it is different. It is different because you see reality from a much closer perspective and you actually have to act upon, upon reality. I would say uh, that whether, whether education improves and in, one, and in what direction, uh, the local level has also a very important role to play. I'm not saying that we should always remain optimistic because we should be critical of what there is. But I think that um, I would say the, 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 the happy side of, of the local dimension of education is that, it, like, like the, that the local actions could be more transformational in terms of what is seen at the global. Somebody was, and I'll link it to the following question. I mean, what is the role of teachers, for example? Something that is very specific, that is that's something that happens probably in the most local of spaces, which is the classroom. Uh, I would say also uh, in the case of uh, the role that teachers have to play in, in, in a way negotiating the curriculum with the diversity of the class in, that they are in front of, uh, how they adapt their practice according to the different needs that people have and how they identify the different needs in whatever whatever they come from, whether they are needs that are linguistic or that are uh, cognitive or that are physical or that are cultural. I, I would say uh, it is true that teachers play a very important role and that's why it is one of, the, one of the global goals. But it is also important to say that uh, at least in global education discourse, it tends to be the case that teachers are taxed with a very big responsibility of whatever happens is up to the teacher without pretty much disregarding all of the enabling conditions that teachers need to have 
for that to happen. But, but no, it is true. It is true that in terms of, in terms of teacher education and in terms of, 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 of what the teachers can do, I would say uh, that being aware of, of these kind of challenges and being aware of the differences uh, that, that students' classes and their backgrounds and their families and the educational community may present is a very good first step. Thank you. I'm going to invite either questions or if you want to extend to another aspect of the discussion from the themes that you've heard, um, please do join in. So, anyone else? Okay. Um, right at the top. Is there anyone else waiting? So okay, right. Uh, I'm just wondering if one aspect of your presentation is a little bit innocent. When you're talking about public and private program your contribution to make, I wonder if the word private is perhaps a misnomer if it's applied to very large corporate entities that possibly the educational stroke commercial ambitions of Pearson, Murdoch, uh, and even on a smaller scale in the UK, uh, strange hybrid units such as uh, uh, CEM or, or CHEM as it's sometimes known. So that, that, that's, that's one issue. And in connection maybe with a particular way of understanding accountability, which is a, a sort of uh, top-down uh, hierarchical uh, framework, whether between them we're seeing a squeezing out of the space for critical understandings of the world, and critical engagement with the world. That's two big questions there. They are. Um, okay. Anyone else at this point? Yes, we've got a couple of hands here. Sorry. <laughs> if you can keep your hands up so that we yeah, know where to come. Thank you. Hi, I'm not a teacher, so my question is not about the school system or the government or anything like that. Um, I think it's quite hard to take a human rights perspective or a child rights perspective or indeed a social justice perspective if you are not thinking about the other things that contribute to educational engagement, performance uh, and, and outcomes. Uh, and uh, looking at the, 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 the um, content of the book here, it seems it's very much focused on the system of formal education that is delivered by public authorities across the world. I think in terms of sustainable development, it is very, very difficult, uh, no, I think that's probably the wrong word, I think it is wrong to think of education in those terms, because I think there are things in terms of rights, support, well-being, inclusion, accessibility, that need to be thought out about well beyond the context of the school. And on a previous question I was asking about the role of teachers, what I suppose I'm asking is about the role of families, the role of other educational inputs and, 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 and uh, supporting uh, interventions that really are absolutely fundamental to any kind of sustainable, equitable educational outcomes. Thank you. Um, my question is about the transition from learning development goals to sustainable development goals and how you talked about the focus in the education area is now much more global rather than just focused on the South. And specifically on how, um, in my experience working in education policy in Scotland, the Scottish Government is quite good at talking about education as a public good, but not as good at recognising or interacting with it as a global good, as something that involves lots of different countries and different people, um, unless it's sort of about internationally employable skills. Um, do you think there's a space for developed countries in this part uh, of these, these goals to really be learning from other places? And particularly, do you have any views on what the Scottish Government might be learning in their own approach to education from other places in the world? Thank you. Right, I think we'll stop there. Um, and if you manage to 
<laughs> I'll try. <laughs> I'll try. <laughs> thank you, Robin. Uh, thank you very much for the questions. They are they are very very good and very big. So I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna try to address some of them, uh, beginning with the first on on the issue of of the private, of the private uh, in general. It is true. Uh, there, there, I wouldn't say there's a, it's a, there's a naive position as to the role that the private sector in particular, the for-profit, uh, has on education. I think one of the, um, one, of the yeah, one of the challenges that is actually highlighted uh, in Rethinking Education and that we're very aware of is how, what kind of effects this, uh, the, 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 the enhanced participation of, pri of the private sector in education can have in terms of equity and, and, and inclusion. And it's sometimes very hard to tell. It's sometimes very hard to tell in terms of, uh, it, it is polemical to begin with, but it is hard to tell uh, what, to, to what effect different uh, private provision might enhance, for example, inequality in the field. It is something that needs to be addressed very, very specifically. I'm thinking about particularly uh, low-fee schools uh, that are supported by different private um, financers, uh, particularly in Africa. And there has been actually a case of, of uh, condemning what these low-fee schools, low, low schools are doing in the field in terms of equity and inclusion. How the forms of selection, the form of who can access this, um, these schools might have effects at the, at the community level. Not to mention, of course, the profit that is made of it. I think the, the one, one of the most pervasive effects that we see of the privatization and the, and the marketization of education is that education is taken out of the public realm. It is no longer seen as a public good or as a common good, but as an individual gain. And I think, uh, which is usually the kind of arguments that support privatization, say, you know, like for example, the case of higher education is, is I think, typical uh, worldwide to say that you're benefiting at an individual level from education and therefore you must pay for it because it's your individual gain, kind of like the human capital development uh, theory. But then these kind of rationales that come from uh, an economic way of looking at education, I think that is the most pervasive challenge we see. It is not only what the private sector does in terms of their intervention in education and what kind of inequality it might represent, not to mention what kind of governance issues in terms of defining and determining the purpose of education of a nation state, for example, which of course is dangerous enough, but also to how education has, there's a, there's a complete uh, economic take to education that we see in global discourse. So this idea of utilitarianism, this idea of education at the service of the economy, this idea of the skills agenda and which are the skills that we want and therefore the ones that we test for, the ones that determine global standard testing uh, instruments and mechanisms. I would say that, uh, that, that, that we're not naive in, in, in thinking of, of, of the private intervention and the effects of the private effects. And I would say, and I would agree with you, that uh, more analysis is, is necessary as to, as to what kind of effects big business brings uh, to education. Just to to tell you of an initiative that is, that is taking place. Uh, a couple of months ago, there was a consultation uh, promoted by uh, the Open Societies Foundation, the Right to Education Project, and the Global Initiative for Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, which took place at the headquarters of UNESCO in Paris. It was the North America and Europe consultation on guidelines that are coming up on or guiding principles that are coming up on how states can and should interact with uh, private providers for private education. 
in order to disentangle all of these ideas of, you know, private education can be private for profit or private not for profit. Private education sometimes includes, uh, for example, participation and, and the costs that are borne by families and individuals, which is, of course, a very different dimension. But there, there are guidelines, for example, in the making as to how states can and should deal with private providers at the great scale so as to ensure that, that the responsibility of the fulfillment of the right to education for all and the, the equality concerns are actually kept within, within the state supervision. So that is, I would say, something important to consider. Um, uh, I think this ties well with the second question on the human rights-based approach. Um, I think I, I don't see, I don't see a, a disagreement between a human rights-based approach and sustainability. I, I, I think actually uh, that, that the human rights-based approach is actually a support for, for sustainability, but in so doing it needs to step out of education systems. What you said is very true. Agree. It is true, and, and the book makes a particular specific reference to it, I think, in the first chapter, that it refers mostly to formal education, so formal education systems, so to speak. And then all of the reflections then have to do not only with formal education, but also with a vision of education which keeps it as a public good. So it's important to say in that respect, it doesn't expand into the idea of informal learning or less formal learning. I gotta say, we have a publication coming up in February 2018, which will. But this one particularly does so um, in, in terms of, of, of formal education. Uh, but, but as you said, I mean, the participation of families, the participation of individuals is something that is important to, to, to highlight. So what happens beyond the formal system? What happens beyond the schooling in education and learning? Um, the third question has had to do with uh, SDGs and whether the North can learn from the South, if I read it well. <laughs> well, I would say yes. Uh, I would say we could all learn from one another, regardless of the hemisphere. Um, a, couple of, a couple of examples of it uh, could be um, when we when we think about the relevance of education, uh, we always consider relevant to what and relevant for whom and relevant in what, in what conditions. And then the specific ideas as to what education should be and should do uh, are, of course, socially and culturally mediated. That's very important. So in the, in the, in the example that you bring forth, which I'm not, I do not know the situation of Scotland, but, but there, you might find the answers in, in the particular locality. But, um, but I would say there are, some, there are some dialogues that are possible between, for example, different forms of knowledge or different forms of looking at education or viewing education. I mean, in the different practices that there are. Uh, for example, just to, just to mention a few which links with the example of, of families and individuals. Uh, we've recently conducted a study on indigenous knowledge and education policy. Uh, in Lat we, we did an example with Latin America. We, it was a, a case study of, of three countries, uh, Bolivia, Peru, and Ecuador, which are three countries which, that have large indigenous populations. Not only that, but are three countries that had actually proclaimed themselves to be multicultural, plurilingual, and a couple of other adjectives, which I forgot. But they're basically moving into intercultural uh, education. Uh, so what we wanted to do was to see in what ways, in a particular locality, the ideas about life and well-being, the Pachamama, the Mother Earth, the, the Sumai Kwasai, which means 
living well or living in harmony, which links a little bit with sustainable development. Uh, the way that the community can interact with the natural environment, the way that the community is part of the school, not only in terms of parental support with homeworks, but it's actually part, like the, 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 the school itself is actually part of the community, not the community part of, of the school. And for example, the relationship that there is in bringing some knowledge, which is usually not legitimated, into the classroom and into the curriculum. So for example, the role that the wise men and women have played in the community, bringing on oral tradition and issues of heritage and issues of the organization of the community as something that is valuable and that's something that is important to be preserved and to be taught um, through generations. That is something, for example, that we saw that happened with indigenous schools, in particular, in particular districts of these three countries, and that was taken up as education policy for non-indigenous populations as well. So for example, learning for different views of development, of education, of interaction, of socialization that are not common in more traditional views of education that are more fixed, that are more school-based, that are more normed around an idea of how education should be. So these are, for example, the kind of dialogues that can happen when we look at practices that are grounded in a particular culture, in a particular locality. That could probably link with what Sheila was asking about the optimism or pessimism of the local, of the local level. I think we could, be, we could be optimistic in that respect of saying we can look and find answers looking at what happens in the local, looking at the local practices. And was there a fourth? Yeah. I think that was it. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Sure. So we've got a little bit more time for maybe two more um, questions or comments. Does anybody have any? You're all thinking. Well, Carlos. It, oh, good, good, right. Well, we will make this the last one. Thank Thank you. I'm a French and German teacher, and if somebody had asked me to stand up there and answer those questions in French or German, I think I would have been really struggling. So, <laughs> well done for even understanding and yes. answering the bills, you did that was excellent. Which brings me to the point I was going to make about um, inter intercultural understanding and how we can do that through a language. And I do think in Scotland we are making a lot of positive moves to, to um, contribute towards the achievement of these goals. I think learning for sustainability Scotland is excellent the way that it works with schools. And I think the, the one plus two policy with the Scottish Government for languages and uh, language learning, because it starts so young now in primary school, I think we mustn't forget it's not just about the language, but if we raise awareness of the language at a young age, we're actually teaching our learners to see through new eyes and we're increasing their awareness um, and also changing perspectives. And I think that's a really important thing. We mustn't forget that although we're looking at what we can do now, the impact is going to come in the future. So how we educate our children now to take those decisions is essential because we're not always going to be here. So it needs to be sustainable. And it starts, I think, with the community, with hope, also with the teacher. And if we don't have that in schools, we're not going to change the way that people think and the way that people perceive things. So I think there needs to be a huge collective joined up um, effort. Thank you. Thank you. Do you want to say anything mm. back? But probably just something about around, around the issue of language, which relates very much with culture. Um, yes, uh, there, is a, there is a right uh, for people to, to be educated in their own language and sometimes to, to bring back languages which haven't been uh, official or haven't been uh, taught officially. And, and I think it's an, uh, it's an important, I mean, it's an important part not only of culture, but also speaking of, 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 of social justice, of, of, of recognition and, and of representation. Um, 
the, uh, not only is it a, is it a, is it a human right, uh, but also I think in terms of the history, the culture, the traditions that come with a particular language, uh, a mother tongue that is acknowledged, that is brought into education is something that is always, of course, uh, of course very welcome. Uh, it is difficult, though, depending on where one is placed. You know, I'm, I come from Mexico, where there are 64 recognized languages. Uh, and if somebody comes from Papua New Guinea, where there are more than 100, I'm sorry, more than 800, then it is very difficult to, these are kind of like the, 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 the challenges of education systems. How do, we, how do we reconcile these great purposes we have of inclusion, for example, linguistic inclusion, with the actual possibilities of producing learning materials in 800 languages? I mean, just the feasibility of it, not to mention the training and the curriculum and the so on and so forth. But that's something that we need to deal with, for sure. Uh, but just on that, on that one side, I mean, on that one note, I would say that the, 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 the potential for, for dialogue, of course, and for understanding uh, that comes together with, 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 a, with a mother tongue, with a native language, all of the culture, all of the social memory, that comes with it. It could be a good, a good means and a good, a good vehicle for, 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 for understanding. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to Carlos, and I'll ask you to thank him in the customary way in a minute. But thank you to each of you as well for the very um, insightful questions and comments that you've made. And several things popped in my mind as I was thinking. I think the word power popped in my mind uh, because actually having the power to actually be present, to actually construct the knowledge or change that knowledge. And if you don't have that seat at the table, then it's very difficult to do that. Parity was another word that came into my head, which couples with the word recognition, which of course Fraser talks about a lot. And when our friend up here talked about the place of communities and families, I think to myself, do communities and families have parity of place <laughs> alongside the formal? My view is probably not yet. Then I think the other thing that occurred to me, which was a kind of idea from Saeed, but developed, uh, Edward Saeed, but developed further by Gloria Becker, is that we all have storehouses. Mm. So what's in our storehouse? Whether you're a policy maker or whether you're a head of an establishment, what is in your educational storehouse? Whose languages, whose views, who, who, who's there and who's not? And I think until we deconstruct our own storehouses, we're not going to actually achieve some of the goals that you talked about. Mm -hmm. So that's a homework, I think, for all of us. And we're in different parts of that journey. So can I um, ask you to join me in thanking Carlos for a very, very um, stimulating, it is a, a lecture, it's an audience that's passionate about education, wants to make sure that education has the potential to make the difference. I can't remember who said try ignorance if you think education is expensive. We're all in that <laughs> boat that you don't want ignorance. So thank you very much thank for you. helping us take further. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.